Okay, great. So we are uh, recording here in the classroom. Welcome again, Martha. Great to have you here. Uh, glad you're able to get in uh, with no issues. Uh, really exciting class uh, today. Going to be focusing on two large topics. Last class we had uh, Old World Wines, which itself is a behemoth. Uh, and today we have New World Wines, which is still a major component of learning about and appreciating wine. And we'll also tie in uh, food and wine matching. Are you much of, a, of an Epicurean when it comes to uh, food and wine pairings, Martha? Good. Okay, great. So the curiosity is what I'm really uh, excited about and, and interested in. Uh, uh, I'm, I also explore when I can, when I get a chance. I've taken a number of food and wine courses and been exposed to a, a large number of great, phenomenal pairings. And we'll take a look at some of those in the second half of, of today's class. So getting started, uh, we'll cover, again, New World wine regions. We'll talk about uh, the major wine producing countries of the New World. Of course, New World being outside of Europe. Uh, and we'll talk about which grape varieties are grown in the regions. In last class, we looked at uh, uh, old world wines and mo mostly by regional uh, style wines, Appalachians. Uh, New World, we're going to focus on, on Appalachians and, and regions, but uh, through a grape variety uh, perspective. So which grape varieties are grown where? And as mentioned, we'll talk about some uh, proven pairing principles uh, and some classic uh, pairings at the end of class. So last week we talked about uh, four major French regions, uh, some of the four, some of the major French wine regions. You remember uh, which ones they were? It wasn't last week, but two weeks ago now. Yep, Loire, great. Bourgogne, yes. Loire, Bourgogne, yeah. <laughs> Champagne, we, uh, we actually didn't cover champagne last week. We're going to look at that uh, next week's class during specialty wines. I've grouped it into the sparkling wine and fortified wine class. It, <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, love a good uh, champagne uh, myself. Uh, so, yeah, so it's Loire, Bourgogne. We also looked at Bordeaux and the Rhone Valley. And unfortunately, Alsace, I've removed from this course. Uh, uh, in the future, when I develop wine 201 and wine 301, we'll certainly look at Alsace and Provence and southwest France and the other uh, major regions of, of France. But just to, for sake of um, keeping it reasonable, uh, uh, we just looked at Bordeaux, Bourgogne, uh, Rhone Valley, north and south, and, uh, and Loire. Yes, most likely. <laughs> Uh, for Italy, we looked at the top three of the 20 wine-producing regions, uh, Toscana, Piemonte, and Veneto in the northwest uh, as well. Uh, in terms of other European countries, if you recall, Martha, we looked at Spain, uh, Germany, yes, very good, with the steep slopes along the Mosul and, uh, and Rhine, and Portugal as well, yeah, very good. So up to speed for today's class, uh, again, we'll look at New World wine regions is, is the first half. Uh, and then later on, we'll look at food and wine pairing. This is a uh, infographic I've pulled from winefolly.com. Brilliant infographic, uh, just to kind of go over it uh, as a kind of teaser lead up to our food and wine pairing. This graph basically shows which styles of food. There we have vegetables, roasted vegetables, cheese, starch, uh, fish and shellfish, different meats and desserts. And with a dot under each of them going to which wine style they pair with at the bottom. So we have uh, light white, sweet white, rich white, uh, sparkling, light red, medium red, full red, and dessert. And so you can follow this kind of uh, schematic as to, you know, desserts obviously pair with uh, dessert. And I think it goes over to maybe sweet white, I guess, would make sense. And then, and for example, um, you know, firm cheeses pairs with, with uh, four, four different styles. So sweet white, uh, sparkling, and, uh, and a couple of the reds as well. So a really great infographic. Uh, also on the bottom, there's further information showing difficult uh, pair, food pairings. Uh, asparagus, artichoke, uh, Brussels sprouts uh, are often tough to pair, largely because of the bitterness um, in these vegetables. And there's one there that I might take contention with, chocolate, which is uh, definitely a tough pairing. 
uh, with wine because the bitterness and the sweet and it's very flavorful, so it takes a strong wine. Uh, but I have had some very successful wine pairings with chocolate, uh, whether it was, um, you know, a, a Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon with a nice uh, dark cocoa. Uh, any reds with fish? Maybe just the shellfish uh, with a light red. Shellfish with a light red. And, and yeah, fish more with, with the whites, yeah. Which is the classic, that's what we always hear is uh, white wine with fish and red wine with meat. But yeah, salmon goes great with Pinot Noir, Gamay Noir. Uh, you could do salmon with, uh, with many, many reds, especially being a fuller, fuller rich, uh, richer fish. Uh, so again, and, and uh, we'll talk about uh, food and wine pairing, how it's mostly an exploration. Salmon with GSM, beautiful. I love it. That's great. So diving into, uh, before getting to food and wine, New World wine countries of uh, the New World wine producing countries. So we have in North America, Canada, and the USA, we'll take a look at. Take a look at South America, Chile, and Argentina. Uh, and I've also included the bands, kind of 30 to 50 degrees latitude, which are the classic latitudes for uh, temperate zones of growing Vitis vinifera that we looked at in week one. South Africa, the very south half of uh, country of South Africa fits under that uh, 30 degrees latitude south and the southern part of Australia as well as all of New Zealand fits in that temperate band. Uh, so we're going to take a look at each of these uh, seven countries today. Uh, some other uh, really interesting countries uh, from the New World, Mexico, uh, Brazil and Uruguay in South America. Uh, Japan, China is is coming on strong. China, I believe, is the third most planted country in the world. So, <laughs> uh, which was very quick. Only ten or twenty years ago, there was there weren't very many plantings, but they've put in um, a very high amount of plantings. Yeah, and it's surpassed, uh, I believe, even the United States in terms of area planted. Uh, so, yet to come into production, but they're focusing on uh, red wines, especially Cabernet Sauvignon, and some really exciting regions like uh, Shandong. Uh, Ningxia, uh, and a little bit further inland towards Mongolia and Kazakhstan, and then down south towards Nepal, some very high elevation uh, vineyards that will be coming online. Uh, I mean, they've only really just been planted in the last five to ten years, uh, but as those start to bear fruit, you know, there's a three to five year uh, latency period between planting and winemaking. And as they start to bear fruit, we'll see some of these uh, really exciting wines coming from China, maybe on our uh, 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 LCBO shelves very soon. Okay, okay, uh, fascinating. Has it? Okay. I haven't been, haven't been up to date with that. Well, well, we'll we'll have to see. Pesticides, okay, okay, very good to know. So maybe best to look for an organic, biodynamic uh, wines and foods. Really, eh? Okay. Great. So let's dive into uh, uh, wine producing countries of the New World. Start with Canada, uh, which has predominantly cool and also some moderate climate regions. Again, these are loosely defined definitions, cool climate, warm climate, moderate climate. Uh, but moderate is about as warm as, as British Columbia will get, and maybe Lake Erie North Shore, uh, which we'll take a look at in Ontario. Ontario produces uh, maybe 50 or 55% of Canada's wine and is the lead producer, including the lead producer of ice wine. Uh, and that stretches uh, worldwide, we'll see. Uh, British Columbia producing one third of Canada's wines uh, but half the awards. So you look at uh, different uh, competitions, um, wine tasting con competitions, and British Columbia is uh, pulling in its lion's share, more than its, its fair share of, um, of top awards. Uh, other producing provinces include Quebec and Nova Scotia, especially the Annapolis Valley and the eastern in uh, Nova Scotia and the eastern townships in Quebec, just southeast of Montreal. And uh, about a 800 to 1,000 hectares in each of those those two provinces, um, but still Ontario and British Columbia uh, leading the way. So breaking it down into Ontario, this is a map from the uh, VQA Ontario website, VQA being, of course, Vintners Quality Alliance. 
I don't know if you can see that on my mug. That's uh, Vint Vintners Quality Alliance. Uh, was established in uh, 88, implemented in 1999, and regulates the legal growing of Ontario wines, and there's also VQA BC for British Columbia uh, wine regions. So from VQAO, we have uh, three principal regions in Ontario. Niagara Peninsula is by far the biggest producing uh, region and divided into further uh, sub-appellations, 10 sub-appellations on the Niagara Peninsula. As we're stretching from Niagara on the Lake in the east to uh, pretty much Hamilton or Grimsby uh, in the west. And mostly on the south shore, southwest shore of Lake Ontario. As, uh, we also have Prince Edward County up in uh, just south of Belleville and uh, Lake Erie North Shore um, towards uh, uh, Windsor. Uh, I think 16, so, so 16 appellations. So VQA Ontario. And then VQA for each of the three regions, Prince Edward County, Niagara Peninsula, and Lake Erie North Shore. So that's four. Uh, and then there are 10 sub-appellations, uh, Beamsville Bench, 20 Mile Bench, Short Hills Bench, uh, um, Lincoln Lakeshore, uh, Four Mile Creek. There's 10 sub-appellations in Niagara Peninsula. So that's 14. Uh, plus, I believe, two for Niagara on the Lake, uh, sub-regional appellation. And the bench, regional appellation, we'll talk about what the bench is. So I think that's 16. And then there's a new one for uh, Lake Erie uh, Islands. I'm, I, it's, I forget the name exactly on, on this new appellation as of 2015 or 16. Uh, but there's, I believe there's 16, 16 or maybe 17 uh, VQA appellations, uh, VQAO, uh, Ontario appellations. 10 of which are, are sub-appellations in uh, the Niagara Peninsula. So speaking of Niagara Peninsula, this is where some of the best Rieslings uh, come from, uh, especially along the bench. So the bench is the same feature that the Niagara Falls. Yeah, it, it, I mean, that's getting into the kind of the, the, the more more detailed uh, side of things. You can you can view on their website, um, I think it's vqaontario.ca or .com perhaps or .org. Um, and this, and they break it down really well to um, to the sub appellations. You're welcome. Uh, but the main the main thing is to focus on on the regional appellations. So Prince Edward County near Belleville, just west of Kingston, Niagara Peninsula on uh, kind of between Niagara Falls and and Hamilton, and then Lake Erie North Shore, predominantly down towards Windsor on the on the very south shore, including Peely Island um, Winery and Peely Island um, Wine Growing Island. Uh, so back to the to the bench. It's, uh, this is the geographical feature that the Niagara Falls uh, tumble over, and it continues all the way south of the the south sh southwest shore of Lake Ontario, and provides kind of rolling hillside. We talked in week one, looking at a vineyard at a map of Terroir and uh, I believe Tuscana, and we talked about how hillside sites uh, grow grow the best wines pound for pound. And on the bench, it is a uh, the reason it's called the bench is there's the escarpment up top. And then it kind of falls down gradually, and then there's another slope, and then falls down towards uh, this the shoreline and Lake Ontario. Um, so it's it kind of looks like a, a bench, you know, maybe a giant's bench. And uh, this is where the best Riesling comes from. Some fantastic Chardonnay from producers like Malavoir and Taz and Cave Spring has uh, beautiful vineyards on the um, on the bench for some top Riesling. And they tend to be quite mineral uh, and well balanced with some acidity, maybe a, an off or sorry, some sweetness about off dry to counterbalance the high, high acidity of these cool climate uh, Riesling wines. Uh, and the best ice wines in the world, uh, some great ones from Germany, some other countries producing uh, other true ice wines, which is frozen on the vine until January, minus eight legally. Um, and some other wine regions producing cryo extraction, which is basically putting the grapes in a freezer and, and creating ice wine that way. Uh, the mineral effect is essentially the soil. It's a limestone soil, uh, a dolomitic limestone on the bench, uh, which uh, limestone is very good soil as, as you see in Champagne and, and Bourgogne. Uh, it's a very good soil for creating mineral, uh, elegant, uh, restrained wines. Uh, and and uh, uh, ice wine uh, being a great example of that uh, high quality Riesling uh, grapes uh, for Canadian uh, Ontario Niagara Peninsula ice wine. Some great Chardonnay as well. We'll see a, a slide on the next page about I4C, 
uh, and some of the best Chardonnay I believe in the world uh, uh, comes from Niagara Peninsula, as well as uh, Prince Edward County, some great producers like Norman Hardy and Closon Chase, um, and as well as uh, I'd like to mention um, the Grange of Prince Edward County, uh, uh, some beautiful, beautiful uh, Chardonnay from, from Prince Edward County. Once the weather's nicer, it's also not not uh, not a long drive uh, from Ottawa and Toronto from the major markets. Uh, so this is a, a photo I've pulled from the I, I4C website. I4C is International Cool Climate Chardonnay Celebration, uh, and it's a, a, a weekend long festival in Niagara. Uh, this is the 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 main event is a, a sit down dinner uh, for I think 100 120 people or maybe more. I think I think it's closer to 1,000 people. Uh, and um, sit down dinner with wine pairings. There's wine tasting with winemakers from all over the world, including certainly Ontario and Canada, uh, but California, as well as Australia, Italy, um, South Africa. And when I was living in Niagara, I volunteered four years in a row. It was fantastic. Uh, volunteering is basically just as much fun, except you don't get to taste. Uh, but both volunteering and going to the events uh, are really great. Uh, there's a on the Friday. There's a <laughs> definitely on Friday. There's a, a school. What's called the School of Cool, which is kind of a seminars and a very high level, almost academic um, kind of caliber discussion on terroir and cool climate and Chardonnay and sparkling wine and, and all these uh, really interesting ideas. That's a lot of fun. Uh, but the the dinner is really uh, spe very special. This is at Ridley College in St. Catharines, and uh, and you you get to taste. I, th I think it's at least 100 different uh, winemakers, wines from all over the world, including Champagne and uh, you name it, they're, they've, they've been there, uh, South America as well. Uh, just a really fun, really great uh, uh, weekend. It's the third weekend in July, uh, third Friday, Saturday, Sunday in July. So definitely worth uh, making taking note of. Uh, moving on to Reds, Cabernet Franc and Pinot Noir, two top uh, varieties. Cabernet Franc is more up and coming. Uh, traditionally, it's been blended in California and Bordeaux and other regions of the world with uh, other Bordeaux varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot to make a Meritage uh, blend. Have you seen this before, Martha? Meritage. Often pronounced Meritage, but the correct pronunciation rhymes with heritage. Uh, and this is a Bordeaux a blend of Bordeaux grape varieties, but from outside of the region of Bordeaux where you can't uh, call it a Bordeaux wine. So California produces a lot of Meritage. Ontario produces some Meritage where Cabernet Franc gets blended in. Uh, but here in Ontario, uh, we're starting to see varietal, uh, standalone Cabernet Francs, especially in uh, Niagara Peninsula and also in Lake Erie, North Shore, where uh, Cabernet Franc, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot uh, grow, uh, ripen really quite nicely due to the slightly more southern uh, climate. And also the sh uh, Lake Erie is a shallower lake than uh, Lake Ontario uh, around Niagara Peninsula. Uh, so Lake Erie being shallower warms up quicker in the summer and uh, and allows the vines along the Lake Erie North Shore to ripen a little bit quicker than uh, they do, especially in Prince Edward County and as well uh, Niagara Peninsula. Uh, Pinot Noir uh, can be great. Uh, highly recommend trying the Cape Spring, but there's other phenomenal producers. Taz is one of them. Um, uh, I would say Coyote's Run produces some of the best Pinot Noir. I love Flat Rocks Pinot Noir, especially the higher end stuff. Uh, but they're, they're great values across the board. The best of the best, Norm Hardy, uh, um, the best of the best will run for uh, usually less than $40, $50. Yeah, Flat Rock is beautiful. Uh, their Chardonnay is great and, and their Pinot Noir is uh, fantastic as well. And we're starting to see, starting to see sparkling wines as well. Uh, with all this high quality Chardonnay, especially from the, the mineral uh, limestone bench, uh, along with really great Pinot Noir, and those make those are great uh, combination for some good traditional, fantastic traditional method uh, sparkling wine from Ontario. Uh, taking a long plane ride west to uh, British Columbia. Uh, uh, there are principally five regions. There are five regions growing uh, vines in British Columbia. Uh, Okanagan uh, Lake and Okanagan Appalachian BQA, which is the picture here of Okanagan uh, uh, BQA, BC, uh, produces 
80 percent of, uh, of British Columbia wines. In the very bottom left of this photo, you can see another valley called the Similkameen Valley, producing a further 10 or 15 percent of, of British Columbia's wine. So between the two valleys here, uh, the, more than the lion's share of British Columbia wines. Uh, we, and and I've never been, full disclosure, but supposedly one of the most beautiful uh, vineyard sites. I've seen pictures, of course, uh, just one of the most beautiful vineyards with Okanagan Lake, as well as the mountains in the background and these sloping vineyards out towards the lake, places like Mission Hill, uh, Quail's Gate, Blue Mountain, producing phenomenal Chardonnay and sparkling wines. Uh, and as mentioned, only about a third of Canada's wines, but at least half the award-winning wines come from uh, British Columbia. I have heard of Cedar Creek, yeah. Yeah, ha haven't tasted a lot, if any. Uh, the only, the, one of the downsides for sure uh, in Ontario, as it is in BC, is we don't see a lot of uh, sharing between the two provincial retailers. Beautiful. And was it more, was it a Bordeaux uh, red, red, like a, um, a Merlot Cabernet? Very good. Or was it more on the whites, like Chardonnay, Pinot Gris? Mixed case, nice. Very good. So wine club? Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So, um, so, you, so you know what I'm talking about with with this beautiful. I've got some friends who are at Mission Hill, and working in and have gone to Okanagan, and it's on my short short list to to get to. What's the CC wine? Oh, Cedar Creek. Okay, I'm with you. <laughs> Great. Interesting. So maybe a small, very small production that you couldn't even get it. Maybe it's all on allotment. Yes. Yeah. A good excuse to go out there again. <laughs> Great. So um, just a couple of obje objectives or things to think about while tasting this um, Louis M. Martini Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, one, do you like it? And if you like it, kind of take it the next step further, which is what do you like about it? Do you like its structure? Do you like it, how delicious it is? That's a valid, viable option. Do you like that it's smooth? Do you like that it's characterful or that it gives you a, a tannin sensation? What, you can, whatever it is that you like about it, it's important to practice that exercise of, of thinking and expressing what, what you like about it. Not just if you do or don't, which is important, but also what you do uh, or don't. That's good. <laughs> Great. Uh, and really, this isn't a, much of a far step from, from what wine critics do. They take it a little bit further from, do I like it? What do I like about it? And then they take it a little bit further. Maybe, how much do I like it? Give me it a score. Berry juiciness. Kind of that delicious, hedonistic, uh, California style. Beautiful. And great value. I think this one's $20 or maybe a, a touch less. And if you can uh, think back to last class's Bordeaux, uh, I think I think you weren't twenty seven. Okay, uh, that may be the Napa Valley. I, I'll have to check it out. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but I think I think generally the California Louis M. Martini is nineteen, twenty, twenty one, something like that. Uh, pretty pretty reasonably priced for a good quality, juicy, uh, well balanced California red Cabernet. Uh, and and compare this to last last class's Bordeaux, shorter finish. That's true. I, I suppose when you taste the Napa Valley Louis M. Martini, you'll really get that delicious uh, longer finish, uh, maybe more concentration, maybe more expressiveness. Kind of picking up that cassis, cherry, cedar, mint. Uh, individual flavors might might be more expressive in the in the California and a longer finish. But I think a good good uh, approximation on this one. Beautiful total cherry, good. So maybe maybe this one's a little bit more fruit forward, that ripe cherry. You're saying there's some uh, berry juiciness, 
uh, sort of that fruit forward uh, characteristic. So moving into uh, south of the border, USA, uh, fourth largest wine producer, uh, with now I suppose the fifth uh, fifth largest area under vine. Okay, so perhaps more reserved uh, might might open up with decanting or in you know in your glass as um, with time it, it can express itself a little bit more, or even in a decanter uh, would open it up uh, or time in a cellar. I suppose this is something that might age. A year or two, uh, uh, and and develop a little bit further after that. Certainly, the Napa would would aid for two to four years, two to five years, uh, quite nicely. Uh, uh, so, uh, not only is the United States one of the world's largest producer, it goes uh, France, Italy are always one and two, Spain, and then the United States produces about a, a, they they have about a million acres planted under vine, and uh, ninety percent of the wine comes from California. Uh, other major states, we'll take a look at Washington State in the north uh, east, northwest, as well as Oregon and New York uh, State in the northwest. I suppose Virginia, Texas, uh, Michigan is coming on, and one is made in all 50 states, uh, but really the, the lion's share is California, uh, as well as um, Washington and Oregon, and, and New York uh, State as well. Uh, now, if you're wondering, uh, Michigan, yep. Yeah. Uh, some great Riesling, some great uh, Gewürztraminer, Pinot Gris, uh, and some really great ice wines uh, in Michigan State. Uh, when you think they're not too far from, um, you know, from from southwestern Ontario, uh, where where it is a viable uh, region as well, and they're surrounded by, uh, f I think, four of the great Great Lakes. So that really that moderating uh, temperature for some of the cool. Uh, winters. If you go a little bit further west into Wisconsin, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, there's still vines grown and wine produced, um, but they're, they're winter hardy hybrids uh, and, and very short uh, ripening season. Yeah, it's uh, definitely more in the upper upper peninsula where the top top wines come from. I think there's maybe about 2,000 hectares, about 5,000 acres, five or, five or 7,000 acres of vines in Michigan State. Uh, and from what I've heard, some really exciting Riesling, uh, Gewürztraminer, uh, some Pinot Noirs, Weigelt or Saint Laurent. Uh, some of the lighter bodied reds are, are really quite nice. Uh, uh, so 50 states, including Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, and these are good examples of states who produce wine but don't grow any grapes. So they'll import uh, either grapes or juice uh, from California, Washington state. Uh, and vinify uh, their wines, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, but it, but still producing it uh, in all 50 states. And considering they have such major uh, tourism markets, that's that's a big factor as well. Uh, is having a ready available market, and and they're strong in that. Uh, uh, so just cleverly sourcing the the fruit from from some more temperate uh, Mediterranean climates. So we will dive into California. This is a map here. We are in the southwest. Uh, of the of the United States. Uh, what do you mean? Does does it make sense to you? Yeah. So um, so the the climates in Alaska and the Hawaii are too cool and warm to grow any grapes. So they don't have any vines planted, or they may have vines for fruit, or they may do other fruits. I know Hawaii does. Um, I think mango wine and pineapple wine, things like that. Uh, Alaska, I don't, you know, maybe some some very cold climate fruits like pears and apples, yeah, if that. Uh, but even though they can't grow any quality Vitis vinifera grapes, uh, it's still possible to grow the grapes in California or Washington State, our major producers, and then ship them under uh, airtight conditions, uh, such that when they arrive to the wineries in Anchorage or in Hawaii uh, or any of the other 50 states that produce but don't grow vines, um, once the grapes, either grapes or juice arrives there, then they can vinify it in the fermentation tanks and add the yeast and, and make the wine in, in, those, in those states. I have not, no, I've never tried. I, more or less, you'd have to be uh, in those states to, to access these wines. I suppose I've heard of uh, some of the pineapple wines and coconut wines being accessible in, in Los Angeles and uh, you know San Francisco. 
Uh, and you may be able to get some of these wines in other states, but it's, it's essentially intended, especially with Alaska and Hawaii uh, and places like, um, you know, Wisconsin or um, North Dakota. Uh, some of these states, it's essentially intended for um, for uh, for for their local markets. So I've never I haven't tried a pineapple wine, so I, I'm not too sure. Uh, so the, here we are in California. A lot, especially along the coast and a little bit further inland is the Central Valley. We won't talk about that, but a lot of the wines labeled California come from this warm, dry, irrigated Central Valley inland. Uh, but really the exciting ones are along the coast, especially north of San Francisco and Napa and Sonoma and the north, uh, north coast counties. Central coast, uh, like Monterey and Paso Robles or San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara are producing some fantastic wines. We'll talk about all these. Um, and there's a little bit south of uh, Los Angeles, uh, but but not a lot of uh, production and, and really nothing uh, being exported um, due to some vine, vine uh, bacterial infections down there. Pier uh, Pierce's disease. Uh, but some other interesting regions that are viable are in the foothills of Sierra uh, Mountains, uh, especially Lodi. We'll talk about Lodi uh, Zinfandel. Uh, but let's go variety by variety. So Cabernet Sauvignon uh, next to Chardonnay is the number two planted variety of California, almost 100,000 acres, uh, acres. Yes, 100,000 acres or perhaps hectares. Uh, I think hectares actually. Uh, Chardonnay has a little bit more, 105,000 hectares. Uh, but Cabernet Sauvignon, especially in Napa Valley, uh, Sonoma Valley, like uh, Knights Valley, uh, AVA in the United States, they don't have VQA, but they have American viticultural areas. So AVAs, so Napa Valley, AVA, Dry Creek Valley, Dry, uh, sorry, Knights Valley AVA and Alexander Valley AVA in the Sonoma County, as well as Paso Robles AVA, uh, producing some great uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it had all pretty much started with the judgment of Paris when Stag's Leap uh, Cabernet Sauvignon from, I think, 1973 vintage won the gold medal, beating out. Um, uh, top chateaus of Bordeaux, um, Lafitte, Latour, Rothschild, um, and this was in 1976, organized by Stephen Spurrier as a blind tasting of uh, California Cabernet and Chardonnay against the best uh, Bordeaux blends, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Bur uh, White Burgundy being Chardonnay. Uh, and kind of open up the world, there's a movie made about it called Bottle Shock, uh, uh, but brilliant uh, idea to kind of expose that uh, prior to this judgment of Paris in 1976, California wasn't considered producing any anything of, of decent quality and, and nowhere else in the New World either. Uh, so this kind of revolutionized and uh, was kind of the, the opening the doors to California and consequently uh, the rest of the New World uh, for some great, great wines uh, to be available. Uh, Chardonnay, uh, uh, it tends to be kind of more fruit forward, just like we see with this uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, if you can picture that cherry and that juicy deliciousness, uh, deliciousness. Chardonnay tends to be quite fruit forward as well. Maybe a little bit of pineapple notes or pear, certainly banana, melon, um, uh, and often with new oak. So from week one, we saw, you know, the kind of vanilla, toast, clove, butterscotch, uh, oak uh, flavor characteristic. And the top uh, uh, AVAs for Chardonnay in California include Napa, uh, Sonoma, uh, uh, Sonoma uh, County, especially in the south in Los Carneros, also just known as Carnero. Uh, some great, uh, they're, there they're mitigated by the cool San Pablo Bay. So this whole uh, Pacific coast is very cold uh, currents, especially in San, San Pablo Bay, just uh, across the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, if you picture, uh, if you think about Mark Twain's quote, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. It's kind of that idea that the San Pablo Bay is very cool. Uh, and that cool air actually goes up into Napa Valley and especially uh, Sonoma Valley, uh, where Carneros is right along that San Pablo Bay coast in the south of Napa and Sonoma uh, valleys. Uh, so some great cool climate Chardonnay from Carneros, Los Carneros as well as Monterey counties, um, just south of uh, the, the tourist city of Monterey. Uh, so Zinfandel uh, was originally thought to be America's own grape variety until it was found out that 
Uh, it originally came from Croatia, uh, a common answer, common ancestor called Tribidrag, which is a great name, uh, also known as Serliana Kastelanski. Uh, uh, was the original obscure, almost obsolete vine that was the predecessor to Zinfandel and also Primitivo, which is uh, uh, in the heel of Italy in Apulia. Uh, Primitivo is the same grape variety that both Zinfandel and Primitivo come from this Tribidrag uh, common ancestor. Uh, so it turns out that even though Zinfandel is best grown perhaps in uh, Lodi and uh, Sonoma, like Dry Creek, Dry Creek Valley, it uh, turns out that this grape variety was, is uh, Croatian uh, in origin. Uh, there's also some great uh, Pinot Noir, especially on the cool coastal like Sonoma Coast, um, uh, Monterey along Santa Lucia Highlands, and in Santa Barbara, if you've seen the movie Sideways, uh, Martha, uh, this takes place in, uh, in Santa Barbara, uh, where, where some of the best cool climate Pinot Noir comes from. Oh, highly, highly recommend that. It's very, very entertaining. It's a Hollywood, Hollywood movie, but uh, great, great, great uh, entertainment for for a wine theme. The, some of the wine, a lot, all the wine references are quite, quite on uh, on on topic. It is, yeah. Triple Drag is Croatian in origin. That's right. From the from the Dalmatian coast. You're welcome. Anytime. Uh, since you're asking uh, great questions, it reminds me that um, I uh, just check in. Did I answer the the um, uh, questions you had on cellaring wine and, and kind of some of your uh, interests in that? Okay. Fantastic. Good. Well, I'm glad. And, and feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Uh, uh, our course ends next week, but there's no reason. Uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to take any questions you have uh, discussing uh, or interested in. And um, that's possible. It's possible. There's only one one real way to find out. And, and um, again, reach out if, if you have any questions on, on the cellaring or, or anything, uh, anything else. Uh, 2001. Oh, 201, wine 201. Uh, it's coming, it's coming, <laughs> I hope. Um, right now it's, it's, in the, it's in the dream phase, soon. <laughs> uh, it's in the dream phase, uh, and, uh, and we'll, only, only time will tell uh, you know, how, how quickly I can, I can produce that. But I thank you for the, for the vote of confidence. I will certainly uh, keep you informed on, on when that's uh, available. Uh, so other US states include Yes, great. Yes, I hope so. Uh, so other U.S. states, California produces 90% of, um, of American wines, and, and Washington State is about 5%, is about half the, the balance. So major wine producer, about 50,000 hectares under vine, and, uh, or 50,000 acres, I suppose. Uh, and, and when you think Washington, you might think kind of cool, uh, Pacific Coast, Seattle, uh, good coffee, uh, and, th and these are all true, quite rainy. Uh, these are all quite true, but with Washington vineyards, 99% um, of the vines in Washington state, maybe more, are planted uh, over the Cascade Mountains, so further in inland uh, uh, east. And, uh, and so they're in the rain shadow of the Cascade Mountains. Uh, so while it's rainy and quite uh, cool in Seattle, um, that rain gets stuck on the Cascade Mountains, and so you have um, this dry, almost desert-like, needing irrigation, but really warm climate, sandy soils uh, on the lee side, on the on the other side of the Cascade Mountains, uh, and so producing some really full-bodied, ripe, good value Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, uh, some GSM blends, Rain Shadow. Yes, that's right. Yep. So if you picture if you picture kind of this cool, wet, rainy weather hitting. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. As that rain gets trapped by the mountains, it kind of falls on the on the peaks of the mountains, and then all the clouds have dissipated. So you just warm, sunny skies. This is true in Alsace, with the Vosges Mountains. Um, there's there's um, the the rain comes from the from the west and and um, uh, hits the mountains, and then there's a, a rain shadow in in Alsace. 
and some other regions like uh, Mendoza, Argentina has, has a rain shadow with the Andes. Uh, but but uh, here in Washington, some great Cabernet Sauvignon, some great Merlot. And because it's actually fairly far north, maybe 46 or 48, <laughs> uh, 46 or 48 degrees latitude north, uh, it is quite cool at night, especially with the sandy soils, which cool down very quickly. Uh, so the, the Cabernet Sauvignon is still quite fresh. There's some really nice uh, fresh fruit flavors uh, to the red wines, as well as the cooler, moderate climate Rieslings that, that they produce. So they can be some great values. A bit further south in Oregon is um, uh, here we are affected by the Pacific. So this is Willamette Valley or Willamette Valley uh, is the major producer of Pinot Noir. About 70 or 80 percent of Oregon is planted to just Pinot Noir, producing beautiful, uh, high quality, reliable, uh, consistent, uh, good quality Pinot Noir. Um, and also Pinot Gris, about 15 percent of plantings in Oregon. Uh, some very good quality uh, Pinot Gris, right, right next to Alsace, actually, in terms of quality. <laughs> uh, uh, move, moving kind of to north northwest, or sorry, northeast, is uh, New York State, predominantly the Finger Lakes region, uh, who has pioneered uh, Riesling, uh, with thanks to Dr. Konstantin Frank uh, in the 50s, uh, um, who was a Ukrainian uh, immigrant. Uh, with a background a PhD in, in plant sciences uh, and was the first to pioneer Vitis vinifera, especially Riesling, uh, in the Finger Lakes and hence in, in uh, New York State. Uh, uh, other regions are include Hudson, Hudson River uh, Valley as well as the uh, North Fork of Long Island producing some great uh, Merlots. Yeah, for sure. So uh, just talking about New York State, uh, northeast uh, United States. Uh, the main region is the Finger Lakes, which is 11, if you look from a satellite. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, Dr. Constantine Frank, first name Constantine, last name Frank. His winery is still there, run by third generation Franks. And um, he was the pioneer in the 1950s to plant uh, Vitis vinifera. So Vitis vinifera, as we know, is the uh, grape species that produces high quality European style wines, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Riesling is an example. This Vitis uh, vinifera. Vitis vinifera. So that's the, the binomial classification, just like humans are homo sapiens. The grapevine, the European grapevine is Vitis vinifera. So the genus is Vitis and the species is vinifera. Um, yeah, that's okay. It'd be in uh, week two on the on the grape variety slides. Uh, and it's uh, that's the species that produces 99% of the marketable, uh, saleable, good quality tasting uh, uh, wines throughout the world, grown, grown anywhere in that 30 to 50 band. Almost all of them are from Vetus vinifera. The other ones uh, can be from other Vetus species. Uh, such as Vitus Lambrusca would be a Concord grape variety. If you've heard of uh, Manischewitz, I'm not doing it any justice, but it is um, kind of Manischewitz and uh, other Concord grapes. These are different species than Vitus vinifera. And those are popular in New York State as well, uh, but, uh, but generally considered too foxy or too, uh, uh, too kind of funky flavored to be considered high quality high quality wines. <laughs> no, <laughs> usually not, but in terms of a wine, it, when it smells a little bit uh, foxy, it's uh, it's generally considered, uh, especially by Europeans, especially the French, uh, to be not uh, of a quality, quality wine. So pull up the polling. We have a true and false question. So true or false, California produces the vast majority of U.S. wines. Absolutely, yep, yeah, about 90%. And, and about two-thirds of that comes from the Central Valley. Uh, uh, but all the high-quality stuff comes from coastal uh, regions or the Sierra foothills. Uh, but major, major producer of, of, uh, of U.S. wine. Doing okay for pace uh, here, Martha.
Okay, great. We'll carry on. Uh, so moving into South America, uh, we'll look at Chile, or sorry, Chile and Argentina. Uh, and uh, so Chile, uh, very thin, uh, narrow country, maybe 100 kilometers uh, at its widest from, uh, from west to east, uh, and very long uh, north to south. And so on the west is the Pacific, uh, in the north is the Atacama Desert, and the Pacific is quite cool as well, just as we see in, in California and uh, North America. On the uh, east are the Andes mountain ranges, uh, tallest peaks in the Americas. And in the south is Patagonia, an, an ice, field, uh, uh, ice field desert, essentially. Uh, so um, because of these four borders, uh, Phylloxera has not um, impacted, has not affected uh, the vineyards of Chile. So we're fortunate uh, for that. And um, strict quarantines uh, still in effect. Okay, so <laughs> from the picture, yeah. So uh, vita vinicultural zonification uh, is a great way f that the Chileans have uh, described what basically is an appellation. Uh, so, so I've got a, a little bit written here. I was, was going to explain that um, traditionally the zonification or the the regionalization, the appellations of Chile, were divided from north to south, uh, but now we see they're divided from west to east west, central, and east. So on the west is the Costa uh, region. That's the blue uh, blue highlighted on the, on the um, uh, west coast. And in the middle, which is the classic uh, regions, especially south of the capital Santiago, in the green, light green, are the Entre Cordilleras. Uh, Entre meaning between and Cordilleras meaning mountains. So they're referring to the uh, Andes Mountains and the coastal mountain range. Uh, so between these two mountains is a large central valley of Chile, and that's the Entre Cordilleras uh, um, zonification. And by vita vinicultural, they just mean grape growing and winemaking uh, zones, grape growing and winemaking regions. Uh, and then the third region in the in the Andes, uh, especially in the foothills, some very high quality wines coming from Andes uh, zone or, or regions. Uh, uh, which is new. This is only as of about 2012 or 2013 that they divided it from uh, west to east uh, like this. So you still do see divided north to south, uh, which we'll uh, talk about some of those regions as well. And a major, uh, major export uh, program in Chile. Um, uh, a little bit, uh, fairly major producer, top 10 or top 15 in the world, uh, uh, but slightly less than his neighbor, Argentina. Uh, even though uh, generally exports at least as much, if not more, uh, than Argentina does. Uh, as noted on, if you go to an LCBO store, you'll see uh, uh, just as big, maybe a bigger section for Chile as you do for, uh, for Argentina. So some varieties from Chile, especially in the Entre Cordilleras Central Valley, south of Santiago, regions like Maipo and Cachapual, Rapel and Carico Mole, uh, producing some great Carmenere. Have you heard of this uh, great variety? Carmenere, it can be spelt, yeah, can be spelt with or without the accents. Uh, uh, but it's a late ripening, full bodied, uh, very similar to Bordeaux. It is a Bordeaux grape variety, an obscure, uh, almost not planted in Bordeaux anymore, but really thrives in, uh, in Chile. Oh, very good. Interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, wh when was that? Uh, how long ago was that? Because Carmenere hasn't, hasn't really been known um at least in chile which is where, where was basically made its name um and that's only been since maybe the 90s early 2000s okay very good interesting because uh, uh, originally a lot of the what is carmenere in chile was initially believed to be merlot another bordeaux grape variety uh, and it wasn't until the mid or late 90s or even early 2000s that they started to realize, it was 1994, they realized a lot of it was actually Carmenere. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll arrange, arrange a time to pick it up. Sounds great. Uh, it is uh, perhaps best known for its green bell pepper characteristic. If you look, uh, yeah, perhaps. If you look uh, back to uh, the Sauvignon Blanc we tasted in week two, um, with that uh, herbaceous, uh, fresh cut grass, asparagus characteristic. It's the same type of green bell pepper, um, kind of herbaceous character uh, that you find in Carmenere. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, some excellent examples from the 
uh, uh, Andes uh, ranges on the in the east, um, especially on the on the foothills of the Andes as they descend. Uh, but um, uh, predominantly, most of the Cabernet Sauvignon comes from the warm, uh, fertile, highly irrigated, uh, easy ripening uh, Central Valley. Uh, and generally produces an eight or maybe ten or twelve dollar bottle of wine uh, that interestingly is still pretty recognizably Cabernet uh, Sauvignon, um, um, but won't be as expressive or uh, mind blowing as um, perhaps any other uh, man, many other regions. Uh, Pinot Noir also thrives in uh, in Chile, especially in the north, in Limari, a region in the uh, Atacama Desert or towards the Atacama Desert. Limari, uh, some great uh, limestone soils producing fantastic Pinot Noir, and even further south in Casablanca and San Antonio uh, are some great uh, good value Pinot Noirs. And uh, generally a good quality Pinot Noir is very tough to grow and, and very tough to make into a wine. Uh, so they tend to be quite expensive. Uh, even a basic Pinot Noir is going to be at least $20 at the LCBO. And this includes Burgundy, it includes Ontario and uh, pretty much every region in the world and good quality Pinot Noir tends to start at at least 40 or maybe 50 or 60 dollars at, at the LCBO and that's and that's not because of the LCBO but just because it's tough to produce a good one for 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 a good quality price with the exception perhaps of Chile uh, where you can get some really great Pinot Noir for perhaps the dry climate or organic growing uh, or just the terroir that they have um, you do get some very good quality Chilean Pinot Noir for under $20, maybe $15 or certainly $19 uh, you can get a great uh, Chilean Pinot. Hopping over the uh, Andes to uh, Argentina. Uh, so it's about a 7,000 uh, meter elevation at the, at the summit of the, the highest point in the Andes. And this is just west of Mendoza which is a city, a river, and a province in western uh, Argentina. We see it highlighted here in the pink, uh, the region of Mendoza. And Mendoza produces about 70% of Argentina's wine, uh, which is a major uh, amount of wine because Argentina is one of the top five uh, largest producing countries in the world. So quite a bit of uh, Malbec, as well as Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Bonarda, uh, coming from uh, Argentina and Mendoza especially. In the south, in the green, you have Patagonia, uh, producing some great Cabernet Franc and Chardonnay. And in the north, uh, uh, in Salta, which I think is the uh, purple highlighted uh, region, uh, you have some great Torrantes, which is a, a very aromatic grape variety. So if you like mal, um, um, uh, Muscat, if you like Muscat uh, or Viognier, these really aromatic white grape varieties that are pretty high in alcohol and weighty, uh, Torrantes is a great example of this aromatic, medium full-bodied style white wine and can often be $15, $14, $16, $17, $17, uh, very good value for high quality uh, aromatic white grapes. Uh, so Malbec originally from France, uh, especially in Cahors in uh, southwest France. Oh. Uh, and, and the literal translation of Malbec is sore mouth, Malbec, uh, uh, because in Cahors, it's very tannic, it's very acidic, it's light in fruit, it's kind of um, raw, rough, and, and ragged. Uh, but in Argentina, with a warmer climate, we're in the lee side of the Andes Mountains, where it's a warm, dry desert with irrigated uh, lands, but only the right amount. And, uh, and it produces quite plush, plummy, dark cherry, um, really rich uh, with some tannins and some acidity, uh, but very good quality, balanced uh, Malbecs uh, from Mendoza. Uh, and, and great values, they'll range anywhere from, from eight or ten dollars for the, for the uh, lower, uh, highly irrigated uh, regions, uh, but up in the uh, foothills of the Andes, you're going to get some very high quality, um, especially the Uco Valley, uh, some very high quality Malbec for less than twenty dollars or twenty five dollars. Of, of very flavorful, concentrated, uh, delicious stuff. Okay, so uh, leaving uh, South America for now and moving over to South Africa. Yes, you can, yep. Uh, not very often. Uh, there is, in it's almost always in vintages. 
Uh, there is some Pinot Grigio Torontes blend for eight eight bucks on the general list, but that's not very exciting. Uh, but the exciting Torontes in vintages, uh, there's one that's regularly available is the Susanna Balbo Torontes is is decent. Uh, but if you go to a big store, uh, on occasion they'll have two or maybe three Torontes that are fifteen to twenty dollars, and those can be um, awesome. They can be great value. They can be expressive. Balanced, concentrated, uh, they can be quite nice. Very aromatic, so if you like that Sauvignon Blanc, it's different aromas, but but just as um, fruit forward or up front uh, with its aromas. Uh, so, okay, shifting into South Africa, uh, uh, which is, again, just in the very southern half of uh, the South African country, on the very southern tip of the, South Af of the African continent. Uh, and uh, regions like Stellenbosch, Constantia, Walker Bay, uh, producing uh, the best quality wines. Uh, and only really since uh, apartheid had ended in 1994. So that was really the turning point where markets were uh, opened up to South African wines. Uh, and the quality renaissance has really started. Which is truly a shame because uh, South Africa has, uh, is, is perhaps the, the new world country. So again, New World being outside of uh, Europe. Uh, and South Africa is the New World country uh, with the largest amount of history. Uh, first planted by Dutch and French explorers uh, in the mid 17th century, uh, especially around Constantia. Uh, but really uh, since uh, 1994 and especially the 2000s with Walker Bay coming online, uh, being in the very cold south by the, uh, 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 mitigated by the Benguela current, so in South Africa, it's a warm climate, but along the coastal regions, there's a very cold uh, wind called the Benguela Current, also known as the Wind Doctor, because it keeps the vines dry and, and clean and fresh. And uh, this Benguela Wind Doctor uh, cools down regions like Walker Bay, producing great uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, world class, uh, and other, uh, some great Sauvignon Blanc, for example, along the southern coast. Uh, but a little bit further inland in Stellenbosch is more Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, and uh, Pinotage, which is a, a su super interesting variety. Have you heard of this uh, great variety, Martha? Or have you tried a Pinotage? Yeah, and what do you think? Uh, I know um, when I taste them with my students, uh, every, it's easy to have an opinion about Pinotage. About 40% love it, or at least like it, and about 60% really don't like it, and, and usually opinions are quite strong, but there's that, that polarization where, where um, yeah, either you either you do like it or you, or you really don't like it, and, and there's not too much uh, in the middle. But it's an interesting uh, grave variety, uh, uh, bred in Stellenbosch at the university in the 1920s, uh, and his parentage are Pinot Noir and what was then called Hermitage, Hermitage, which if you remember from last class, the Old World is a northern Rhone uh, region. Uh, and even though there's no saint so in Hermitage, that's what they called uh, the great variety saint so So it was a blend of Pinot Noir and saint so which they called Hermitage, gives us Pinotage. Uh, and great, great variety, uh, not planted as much as Cabernet Sauvignon or even Syrah, uh, which is producing some high quality reds in Swartland. Uh, and many Stellenbosch, many regions of um, South Africa, uh, uh, but still the Cabernet Sauvignon is high, highly uh, planted and and of good quality uh, and good value as well. Uh, Chenin Blanc is the leading uh, grape variety, both for reds and whites. About 20% of South Africa's uh, vineyard is planted to Chenin Blanc uh, because in this warm climate, we're at about 32, 34 degrees latitude south, uh, and in this warm climate, Chenin Blanc holds on to its high acidity uh, really, really well, uh, giving a, giving a well-balanced um, wine that's still quite full, full flavored. Excuse me. So just one question from uh, Argentina for the most recent section. And Malbec does translate to sore mouth. Excellent. Very good. I would like to, uh, in my in my dreams, I'd like to integrate a uh, assessment component to wine 301 or perhaps even wine 201. Uh, that would be more challenging than than these questions. But as I as I mentioned, uh, I like to start off with these polling questions just to ensure that uh, that the main ideas are are coming across uh, well. 
So glad to see that they are. Let's carry on to Australia and New Zealand. So Australia, a uh, very warm, dry desert, uh, uh, wild wilderness in the in the in the inland parts. Yes, yeah, yeah. So what I was thinking with wine two hundred one was having maybe a nine week course, and wine three hundred one would be maybe a twelve or or sixteen week course, and then it would stretch out a little bit more. We'd do a deeper dive and broader. Uh, but but stretch out over a over a larger period of time, and then with the assessments. Thank you. This is, hope hope it comes to fruition. Uh, so uh, staying focused on Australia here, uh, being a warm, uh, especially the inland um, of, of Australia. If you think about the the, the dry arid uh, desert of of north uh, northern Australia, most of Western Australia, most of Queensland. And most of South Australia as well, but in the very southern uh, half of the southern states, you do see some temperate uh, regions, or at least warm or moderate climate regions, and especially uh, mitigated by the Southern Ocean, so Tasmania and Victoria along the south uh, southeast coast of Australia, uh, and the very southern southwestern part of um, South Australia, Kunawara, which we'll take a look at. Uh, are mitigated by this cool southern ocean. Uh, uh, they, they experienced a surge in popularity, especially some of these critter wines, yellowtail, uh, little penguin, you know, wines with a, with a cute little animal on the label that sold extremely well in the 90s. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of high quality. These came from uh, vastly uh, irrigated, overcropped uh, inland regions like uh, Riverina and Riverland. Um, and uh, and generally were, were acceptable or passable at best. Uh, but now we're starting to see pockets from uh, some of these uh, mountainous regions, uh, or you, especially in South Australia, like Barossa and McLaren, Barossa Valley and McLaren Vale, uh, and Victoria as well, Tasmania, Western Australia, uh, producing some high quality, uh, good value, good value wines because they're still largely uh, under, undiscovered. Uh, five states uh, out of the eight or nine in Australia produce uh, wine, uh, good quality wine. So Western Australia, uh, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, and Tasmania. Uh, there's no real wine production in Northern Australia and a little bit in uh, Queensland, uh, but not uh, high quality uh, production that we're, we're used to seeing here in our market. Uh, uh, some of these world-class iconic wines that are... Um, represented best in Australia and, and almost nowhere else in the world are, are really iconic to Australia, include Hunter Valley Semillon, uh, which they sometimes call Semillon. So grape variety is Semillon with the accent. Semillon. Uh, there we go. So in France, it's called known as Semillon. And in Australia, it's known as Semillon or Semillon without the accent. Uh, and it's great style uh, from Hunter Valley white wine uh, that's very age worthy uh, and from victoria a little bit further south of uh, sydney we have rutherglen muscat uh, being a fortified dessert uh, raisin wine that's delicious and and perhaps one of the most if not the most uh, complex uh, wine i've ever tasted and and one of the most that is available uh, in terms of complexity The way that you'd be interested in this, because it's produced in a similar way to uh, Madeira, where there's, um, except they'll use they'll use dry rais raisinated. They leave the grapes on the vine late into the fall, which is maybe April or May. And so these raisins come in. They start the fermentation just like they do in Madeira, and just like they do in Madeira, they add grape brandy, a spirit, uh, to this new new fermented wine. And that grape brandy kills the yeast, so there's a lot of residual sugar left over, um, uh, and 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 then the fortification, the brandy flavors itself, uh, and uh, just a little bit of alcohol from the from the fermentation. Uh, but what, what's similar to uh, with Rutherglen Muscat, what's similar to Madeira, is the way they age it is in the the criaderas, the the 
oak wooden barrels in the rafters of these hot houses in this warm climate region over the winter and for 10 or 15 or even 20 or more years uh, they'll age these delicious nectars in these um, barrels and almost like a sherry solera system they'll they'll blend them fractionally they'll fractionally blend them we'll see that next week uh, and it just produces a, a delicious fantastically complex uh, really beautiful uh, dessert wine so lucky enough to taste a couple uh, when I was in London at the Australia tasting, just brilliant, brilliant stuff. Uh, the main focus for Australia, however, are pretty much three grape varieties. Of course, we're familiar with Shiraz and GSM blends, the S being Shiraz, of course. And they tend to be a little bit different than the Northern Rhone style Syrah, like, just like we saw in week two. Tend to be quite ripe, soft, very jammy fruit. There are a few regions in Victoria that produce a little bit more restrained, such as the North Rhone style, uh, but more or less they're going to be a uh, ripe, jammy, uh, kind of blackberry, uh, stewed cherry uh, characteristics, especially from Barossa Valley and McLaren Vale. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is widely planted, uh, number three out of the, the top three grapes, which produce about 60 or 65% of Australia's wines, uh, Shiraz, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Chardonnay. Um, uh, and some, some top regions for Cabernet Sauvignon include Kunawara on the west uh, in Margaret River, uh, sorry, Margaret River in the west, uh, and Kunawara in uh, South Australia, uh, producing some high quality, uh, moderate climate, similar style climate to uh, that of Bordeaux. And for whites, uh, Chardonnay uh, being by far the most planted white grape variety in Australia, uh, and can be that fruit forward oak plush style that we see also in California and other warm climate regions throughout the world, like South Africa and Chile, uh, but can be quite well balanced from some of the cooler pockets, especially when you get down far south into Tasmania, uh, producing some uh, base wine for sparkling wines from the Chardonnay. Little bit of Sauvignon Blanc in Australia. We see it in uh, Adelaide Hills in South Australia, producing some great uh, Sauvignon Blanc and uh, perhaps a few pockets in uh, Victoria and New South Wales, uh, but uh, almost to the shame of Australians that New Zealand has really uh, dominated this style for, for the world, uh, and especially from that part of the world. Um, uh, apart from a few pockets here and there, to my knowledge, uh, and perhaps maybe in Margaret River in Western Australia, there's not a lot of uh, Sauvignon, not a lot of uh, high quality Sauvignon Blanc, uh, but perhaps just when compared to New Zealand, uh, a little bit further, about a thousand kilometers uh, to the southwest. And speaking of New Zealand, uh, Sauvignon Blanc pioneering the way. So we saw only as recently as uh, the 1970s was the first planting of Sauvignon Blanc in Marlborough. Uh, and it wasn't until 1985 or 1986 when Cloudy Bay came out and won Best Sauvignon Blanc in the World for its style, uh, which was a pioneering, uh, revelatory uh, way of producing Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, the way they had done it, um, we'll, we'll talk about it on the next line, was a staggered harvest, so a three-tier harvest. Uh, and most of it, and this was all coming from uh, Marlboro, uh, which has two-thirds of, of New Zealand wines, and, uh, and about 50 or 60% of New Zealand's uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, also on the South Island, so New Zealand being two islands, on the South Island you have Central Otago at about 44, 45 degrees latitude south, uh, being the world's southernmost uh, wine region, uh, producing predominantly Pinot Noir, uh, a very exciting uh, quality. On the North Island, capital, uh, sorry, major population Auckland uh, uh, is a little bit too tropical and uh, kind of humid for high quality wine production. But a lot of the wineries will source fruit from Gisborne or Hawke's Bay, where you have very gravelly soils and a climate similar to Bordeaux, producing fantastic Merlot uh, and Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon. And a little bit further south on the North Island, uh, is well, uh, near the capital Wellington, is a region called Martinborough. Oops. Martinborough. Also known as Wairarapa. Uh, in the in, in the native language, and uh, some great Pinot Noir from from Martinborough and Wairarapa. 
Uh, but really, Sauvignon Blanc, by far the, the most planted grape variety, especially uh, coming from Marlboro. Uh, and so uh, I had mentioned a little bit about the staggered harvest. This was a style pioneered by the uh, New Zealands. And, and to my knowledge, almost all New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is made in this way, including uh, the Babbage from week two, um, Martha. And the way this is made is they'll harvest the Sauvignon Blanc vineyards in three segments. So they'll harvest the first third uh, prior to full ripeness, so a little bit earlier in the season. And when they do that, you're getting these underripe, especially uh, fresh cut grass and bell pepper and asparagus aromas and characteristics. And they'll harvest a third of the Sauvignon Blanc vineyards uh, at, at ripeness, getting that peach and perhaps guava uh, characteristic, maybe lemon. And they'll harvest a third of the vineyards at over ripeness. So they'll wait a further two or three weeks and ripen overripe uh, Sauvignon Blanc grapes, uh, giving you guava, papaya, mango uh, flavors, really these tropical fruit uh, delicious flavors. And then they'll blend all three uh, vinified crops into, into uh, Sauvignon Blanc wine and, uh, and produce this style that has a little bit of underripe green bell pepper, fresh cut grass, a little bit of lemon and peach, and a little bit of overripe uh, tropical fruit uh, all in the same uh, Sauvignon Blanc. So really fresh, creative, and delicious, uh, in, in, ingenious way to, uh, to produce a really unique uh, wine style that is now mimicked in France and uh, South Africa and Chile and, and Australia and, and all throughout the world. Uh, and so Chardonnay is another, another major grape variety of New Zealand, and especially Pinot Noir, uh, where the majority is grown uh, in Marlboro, uh, but some great outposts in central Otago in the very far south of the South Island. Um, and uh, next to perhaps Oregon, I would say these are some of the best, if not the best, uh, Pinot Noir from central Otago, uh, uh, Pinot Noir wines uh, in the New World. Okay, so just one question here on the most recent section, true or false? So true or false, New Zealand has the world's southernmost wine growing region. Absolutely true, very good. That being central Otago, there are a few vines in Patagonia in Argentina, south of the Patagonia region in Argentina in the true um, ice fields, uh, but very small production. Uh, less than 100 hectares or 100 acres. Uh, so in terms of commercial viable viticulture, uh, Central Otago's got the southernmost. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Well, you had a 50 or 50% 50, 50 chance. And you're batting 1,000 so far. So let's pause uh, the video there. And um, we'll carry on with uh, wine and food matching. Uh, after just a short break. Thank you much. Great, so uh, carrying on with our uh, section two, uh, second half of today's uh, class, uh, being wine and food matching. And so that's always the question, is it wine and food pairing or food and wine pairing? And that's up to you to uh, have fun with and decide. Uh, but for our wine and food matching, we'll take a look at two uh, principal components. We'll talk, talk about what uh, I call proven interactions. Uh, so even though there are no rules to wine and food matching and pairing salmon with GSM is a great idea because if you like salmon and you like GSM, then together it's, it may have synergy. One plus one equals three or more. And that's what we're looking for. And so even though there are no rules, there are some things that are proven interactions uh, that we'll talk about. So some things that do uh, actually uh, come about. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. And so, and so this is the new wave of thinking of food and wine matching is take the wine you like and take the food you like and, uh, and enjoy them together rather than really getting bogged down in what has to go with what. And Jancis Robinson has a great quote, which is uh, she's, uh, she's the author of some of the top, most many of the top uh, wine texts and uh, she's a master of wine. And her quote is, who has ever been struck down by lightning for getting the wrong food and wine <laughs> matching? Uh, which is brilliant because there is a lot of fear and apprehension perhaps uh, about pairing food with wine and doing it the right way or 
but it's all about exploration and, and enjoying what, what you like together. They, they go so well together. And, and we are looking for synergy, so uh, kind of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts uh, type of effect. Uh, so we'll take a look at those proven interactions and we'll take a look at some classic pairings with, with photos uh, uh, to talk about what, what some of these classic pairings are. Well, that's okay. I, I would like to think that the more progressive and uh, open-minded sommeliers and servers uh, are happy that, that you're exploring with, uh, with wines and foods that you like. And if not, to the side with them. Uh, so Ontario Pinot Noir, if you get a chance to taste this, great. Uh, if not, I'll just talk about uh, what it tends to be like. Uh, it's a light-bodied grape variety. It might be 12.5 or 13%, this Cape Spring Pinot Noir, uh, or almost any Ontario Pinot Noir. Uh, so try to think about the weight of that wine. And weight is just the amount of fullness or, or weight on your tongue. Uh, and the analogy is to uh, milk. So a skim milk type of fullness or weight would be light-bodied. Whereas a, a whole milk would be medium bodied and a half and a half cream is kind of full bodied, weighty uh, style. So GSM, this Cabernet Sauvignon that you're tasting, uh, might be on the fuller end of the, of the weight spectrum and Ontario Pinot Noir might be on the, on the lighter end. Right, exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, this this is a great example, or, or any other Ontario Pinot Noir. You can also do uh, Burgundian uh, Burgoyne Pinot Noir, uh, or some of the ones we've mentioned today, like Central Otago, Martinboro, Marlboro, uh, Oregon. Uh, uh, any of these lighter style wines tend to be Pinot Noir tends to be one of the most food friendly uh, wines. So uh, yeah, because it's lighter and bodied, it, it does pair really well with light bodied and medium bodied uh, dishes. Uh, so we'll take a look at some classic examples as well. I love food and wine pairing because you're set up for success in that most wines pair with most foods for most people. Uh, so it's true that not all wines pair with all foods for all people, uh, but most of the time you're, you're going to have a successful uh, food and wine pairing. So when you're at the restaurant with your friends or family uh, and they look to you to order the wine because you're the wine expert, um, you're really set up for success. So if the sommelier has chosen the wines correctly for the restaurant, uh, you'll, you'll pretty much have a successful pairing nine times out of ten with most wines, uh, f with most foods uh, for most people. Uh, so just some ideas about uh, food and wine pairing principles. Uh, so most wines pair with most foods for most people. Uh, also, wine and food pairing is objective, uh, and it's subjective. And the example I like to use is peppercorn steak uh, with Shiraz. And this is an objective pairing because it's absolutely true that the spice of the peppercorns is going to light up that high alcohol Shiraz and really give you a warm sensation uh, on your face and palate. And that's the objective part. But it's also subjective in that you may like that sensation and you may not. Uh, so it's completely personal as to whether or not you like that um, that really strong, uh, almost igniting of, of, the, of the spice with the high alcohol Shiraz. Uh, and so personal preferences are uh, the most important. Uh, whether, if you like it, it's a good pairing. If you don't like it, it's not a good pairing, regardless of, of what's technically correct or uh, food pairing principles or classic pairings. Uh, whatever you like, is let, let that be, be the best guide. Uh, for you and for, for your friends and, and for, for all of us. Uh, and one of the reasons that is true is because there are different types of tasters. Not everybody experiences food and wine and food and beverage in the same way. Um, there's kind of a spectrum of uh, what's called a hyper taster, a taster and a tolerant taster. And it's kind of split up in the per percentages of the population that I've listed here. And so tolerant tasters are somebody that likes a strongly flavored uh, food and drink, maybe a strong espresso, cigar, uh, you know, Barolo, Nebbiolo, GSM perhaps, um, uh, and really strong flavors, and, and they can tolerate a very high uh, level of flavor. And they almost demand, they almost need a very high level of flavor uh, to, enjoy, to enjoy the experience. 
On the other end of the spectrum is the hyper taster, who really has way more taste buds. You know, they feel the, the tags in their shirts quite a bit more, so they may cut those out. They can see and hear things almost in hyper sensitive mode. And, and because they're hyper tasters, some people call it super tasters, but hyper taster is perhaps a more correct uh, term. And they really detect flavors really, really strongly. It's almost like living in neon lights. And, uh, and so they like lightly flavored foods and lightly flavored wines. So Chablis or Muscadet Sabre Men, um, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, really lightly Pinot Noir, Gamay Noir, light bodied reds, they prefer those light uh, tastes. And in the middle, about half the population is a tolerant, uh, sorry, a taster or a um, kind of a moderate taster. And, and they can kind of span the gamut. They pick out bitterness a little bit, but not as much as the hyper tasters. And, and they pick it out a little bit more than the tolerant taster. Um, uh, and they like kind of a wide range of foods and beverages, whether it's coffee, half, uh, dub, uh, you know, double double coffee, uh, or um, you know, they like Shiraz and Sauvignon Blanc, really flavorful uh, foods quite a bit. There is, yeah, absolutely. If you go to, if you, if you do a search, you should be able to order what's called, uh, I think, if I have this correct, they're called PTC strips. And that stands for some sort of chemical that's on these strips, but it's a food grade chemical. And uh, the way these strips work, the, you can order them from, um, I'm sure you can can get them online. And it'll only test to see if you're a hyper taster uh, or not. Uh, so the way they work is it's a strip, so you on a piece of paper, and it's got this PTC food grade chemical on, on the paper. And so you put it in your mouth and chew it. And if you're a hyper taster, you'll know immediately uh, that you're a hyper taster because it'll just be a disgusting, hot, like rotten vegetables, really bitter, extremely, extremely bitter taste uh, in your mouth. And if you're not a hyper taster, you don't have the ability to detect that chemical. So tasters and tolerant tasters do not detect the PTC chemical. Uh, so that's how you can determine if you're a if you're a hyper taster or not. Uh, extremely bitter, you're a hyper taster. No taste or just a little bit of bitterness, you're you're either a taster or a tolerant taster. I, I've done this uh, I think three or four times, and uh, just fun to do it in a group as well. You can get your. Um, uh, I think I'm not a hyper taster. I think I'm a taster because I can pick out a little bit of bitterness, uh, and I I like strong tastes and I like light tastes. Uh, but I really like the middle range. I like GSM. I like Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I like espresso, but I also like tea. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm more of an experientialist. Where if it's if it's very flavorful and complex, I enjoy I enjoy tasting uh, uh, flavors and and a broad range of of tastes. Yeah, definitely. Great to do in a group because then you will get some reaction of some people. Again, if you have a group of 10 people with you, odds are two or three will be hyper tasters and odds are seven or eight will be not hyper tasters. And then you'll you'll see what's and, you know, they're all the same strip that's going into everybody's mouth. So if you have a large group, you can get a good, good sense of uh, of, of the actual effect. It's you'll see the reaction right away. It's a very, very extremely bitter uh, sensation and, and really gross taste. Um, almost akin to cilantro. Uh, you know how some people uh, love cilantro and some people hate cilantro uh, because they taste it, they actually taste it differently. This is, it's for a different reason than the, these three uh, types of tasters. Uh, but, but same, uh, same idea where, where some people have a different uh, chemical reaction in their mouth and in their brains to cilantro than, than others. And same for, same for these uh, tasters for different reasons. Yeah. There we go. So uh, again, with uh, food and wine pairings, we're looking for that synergy. So uh, where one plus one equals three or more, uh, where the sum is greater than, or sorry, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And what, I, what what's meant by that is when you take a wine that's good and food that is good, if you get synergy, then together they're they're better than the two would be individually added together. Uh, so you are looking for synergy with with a food pairing, um, and we'll see some examples of classic food pairings that do more often than not demonstrate that that food and wine synergy. So some interactions to keep in mind um, uh, that um, again have fun and explore with your food pairings, uh, but these are more or less true or as true as um, as as you can refer to with with something that's as subjective and objective as as food and wine pairing. Uh, so, but it, uh, taking these for truth, 
uh, the weight of the dish should equal the weight of the wine. And again, think of the weight of the wine as being kind of a skim milk lightness or a half and half cream fullness or somewhere in the middle. And we're all familiar with weights of foods. We're, we're, we've all been exposed and experienced a lot of different foods uh, in our lives. So try and match the weight of the food. So if it's a salad or um, a light white fish, it might pair with a lightly weighted wine. And if it's a full flavored food or a salmon or ribs or steak or full flavored foods, uh, stew, for example, that's going to pair generally with a fuller weighted uh, wine. So something, uh, if you're looking for clues on how to determine the weight of the wine, it's very closely related to alcohol. Uh, so for red wine, 12 or 13% is going to be light bodied and 14 or 15% is going to be full bodied and, and 13 to 14 somewhere in the middle. Uh, so uh, suggestion number two is pair the wine to the strongest flavor on the plate. Uh, if you're having chicken, that's great. Uh, but is it in a, a garlic sauce or lemon aioli or piccata? Or is it more of a um, grilled chicken or fried chicken or roasted chicken or broiled chicken? Um, or, or you know, how's it being prepared? So always match with the strongest uh, uh, cheese. Great. Yeah, cheese is such a, such a food-friendly, uh, wine-friendly food. Another thing that tends to be true is foods that grow together go together. Uh, 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 Chianti Classico with Passan Bolognese sauce is a great pairing. Uh, so is um, Calvados with uh, Camembert, again a regional Normandy cheese with a regional Normandy uh, apple spirit. Um, foods that tend to grow together tend to tend to go together. Millions of other cheese examples in, in France and Quebec and throughout the world with, uh, with regional uh, wines. Uh, the dessert wine must always be sweeter than the dessert. This is almost always true, where if the wine is not as sweet or, or less sweet, uh, if it's as sweet or less sweet, then what happens when you eat a sweet dessert? The wine uh, tends to taste very sour, and all the sweetness of the wine and fruitiness of the wine disappears to the sweetness of the dessert. Uh, so you do need a, a wine that's sweeter than the food that you're having, if it's fruit uh, or something sweeter. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's probably one of the, the most recognizable ones is if you have some a food that's sweeter than the wine you're having, it'll almost always taste sour and, uh, and acid. Uh, that being said, acidic foods love acidic wines. That's what I mean by acidity loves acidity. Uh, so if you think uh, sauerkraut and bratwurst with mustard uh, and a high acid Riesling go fantastic together, uh, if you think um, uh, uh, a white fish with a squeeze of lemon paired with a Chablis or a high, another high acid Chardonnay wine uh, go fantastic together. Um, acidity tends to pair really well with uh, acidic foods with acidic wines. Another truth is that bitterness in food will enhance bitterness in wine. When we looked at the Wine Folly uh, infographic at the top of class, uh, this was an example of the bitter foods at the bottom, asparagus, green beans, uh, Brussels sprouts, uh, artichokes, uh, very bitter foods, and that's going to enhance the bitterness in wine, especially a red wine, uh, such as Barolo or Cabernet Sauvignon or even GSMs have a lot of bitterness, uh, and that'll be enhanced. Uh, the, the bitterness of the food enhances the bitterness of the wine, which again you may like and you may not like. Uh, so different preferences and different tolerances too. If you're a hyper taster and you already detect a lot of bitterness in salad and a lot of bitterness in Nebbiolo, then salad and Nebbiolo is going to be even even more of a strong, strong reaction. Uh, and so count countering that, salt tends to soften a harsh wine. So salt and acidity tend to be two ways to soften and bring out the fruit of a wine. They're great, great um, uh, taste to have in a food uh, that can that can make a wine pairing uh, even very successful. So looking at uh, classic pairings now, uh, uh, each of the following pairings, I think there's maybe eight uh, eight pairings, and each of them will demonstrate synergy. One plus one equals three or more, um, and see if you can think of some of the previous food pairing principles or proven interactions um, that explain some of these synergistic or synergistic uh, pairings uh, that we'll take a look at. And I warn you, if you haven't had lunch yet, uh, this is a little bit of, of uh, hedonistic uh, food, uh, uh, pho uh, beautiful photos with uh, kind of salivary, salivary stimulating uh, 
uh, pairings. So, of, uh, of course, starting off uh, meal champagne and caviar. Uh, don't know if I've ever had uh, perhaps once or twice true caviar with uh, champagne or other sparkling wines, cava, uh, traditional method sparkling wines like um, crema or cava uh, or some new world or, of course, champagne. Uh, all of these we'll look at next week. Uh, pairs great with caviar because the saltiness and the very rich flavor of the caviar tends to pull out the, the uh, saltiness calms the acidity, high acidity of the champagne. And the rich flavor of the caviar and the strong flavor of the of the vintage dated or traditional method champagne or sparkling wine uh, pair uh, really well together. Uh, quite a few wines go really phenomenally well with oysters. Uh, foremost, perhaps amongst them, uh, is Muscadet. Other great styles include Chablis or Champagne or other traditional methods sparkling wines like Limou. Uh, this is a... Uh, French traditional method sparkling region called Limoux pairs fantastic with oysters. Again, that saline um, kind of salty oyster with perhaps with some some seawater in it, uh, pairing great with uh, these high acid uh, style wines. And uh, matching body with body. So oysters are fairly light bodied food. Muscadet, a very light bodied wine, same with Chablis and, and many sparkling wines. Uh, that, that light body pairing with light body uh, quite nicely. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so same effect as with uh, caviar. The saltiness in the potato chips uh, pairing great with the high acid in the, in the champagne. Uh, so uh, moving along to Sancerre and goat cheese. Uh, these are Sancerre, of course, is Sauvignon Blanc uh, from the Loire Valley, from the uh, central vineyards of the Loire Valley in northern France. And it's a high acid grape, uh, very aromatic. Uh, and goat cheese is quite high acid as well. And there's quite a few... Uh, goat cheese producers, especially St. Moore, uh, was one of the top St. Moore cheese. Uh, goat cheese was, or Chevra, uh, Chevra, was one of the top uh, pairings I've ever had in my life was the St. Moore or Chevra. Uh, goat cheese with uh, uh, Sancerre, because St. Moore comes from the Loire Valley, and so does Sancerre. Uh, and the high acid of the, of the Sauvignon Blanc with the high acid goat cheese. Uh, and the regionality of, of pairing local wines with uh, local foods. Uh, just a beautiful uh, synergistic pairing. Uh, Pinot Noir and duck or any game bird, if you're into pheasant or quail uh, or goose, uh, uh, Pinot Noir pairs fantastic with duck when you think Bur Burgundian uh, style. Yeah, <laughs> I will include that next time. Uh, uh, Left Bank Bordeaux. Um, so Cabernet Sauvignon, also Rioja and Chianti Classico go fantastic with lamb, kind of that medium full-bodied wine with medium full-bodied uh, rich gamey foods and very flavorful Bordeaux with very flavorful lamb. Uh, and uh, Zinfandel for more of the summer or barbecuing style, perhaps not today, uh, but uh, once the barbecue's uh, fired up, really nice smoky ribs perhaps with a, uh, a barbecue sauce. Um, and a really rich red Zinfandel from California. Again, not it's a dry wine, but some of that ripeness and glycerol and high alcohol from this high alcohol uh, Zinfandel from Lodi or, or other top quality California regions uh, tends to go marry really nicely with the with the sweetness of the barbecue sauce and the gaminess and richness uh, of the of the smoky ribs. Just two last pairings here, a port, but really exciting, interesting pairings. Uh, have you ever tried port and Stilton, Martha? Beautiful. So, so I'm I'm preaching to the converted. These are very flavorful wines, especially a high quality port like vintage port, or a or a ten or twenty year old tawny or Colieta tawny. We'll talk about these next week, uh, along with Madeira and sparkling wines. Um, uh, but the rich flavor of a of a good quality port, the rich flavor of a Stilton, some of that salt from the Stilton cheese is going to mellow the high alcohol of this fortified port wine, uh, making a beautiful, uh, beautiful pairing. And a beautiful pairing, ice wine with fruit tarts. Uh, the, just the sheer concentration of that fresh fruit pop from the ice wine, uh, really peachy or strawberry for a red ice wine, uh, uh, marrying really well with, uh, with a nice uh, fruit tart.
And that's right. Yep, exactly. So ice wine will be ice wine. Uh, they're starting to produce uh, drier style ice wines around 100 grams per liter. Uh, but a traditional ice wine is about 200 grams per liter, 15 grams per serving of, of natural grape sugar. Uh, and at 200 grams per liter of residual sugar, that's going to be sweeter than fruit. Uh, and would actually pair with butter tarts or things that are quite sweet. Uh, but it just makes a beautiful pairing with fruit, which is quite a bit less sweet. Uh, so you're still getting the sweeter ice wine. Uh, and very flavorful, nice marriage of, of fruit flavors from the wine and fruit flavors from, from the fruit tarts. A bit of a, a wordy question here. It's a true or false. For a successful wine and food pairing, try to mash the weight of the food with the weight of the wine and pair the wine to the strongest flavor in the dish and have fun. And very good, yeah. Still batting a thousand. That's very good. Even if one was a guess. Great, so that uh, uh, pretty much wraps up um, our, our class four on New World Wine Regions and food and wine matching, or wine and food matching. Some of the New World Wine producing countries we covered, North America, South America, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. And we looked at some f wine and food pairing principles. If you can indicate something you enjoyed learning in today's class, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, always like to learn uh, what what uh, what you're connecting with and, and enjoying learning. Uh, next week, our fifth and final class, we're going to look at specialty wines like sparkling wine and fortified wines. Um, uh, I'll mention about uh, Madeira as well. Uh, and we'll also take a look at a lesson on how to read a wine label, what I've dubbed Eno Literacy. And, uh, and one of the best classes I've ever taken very early in my wine studying career was, was how to read a wine label. Uh, so looking forward to that uh, next week. Okay, very good. Well, don't forget to explore. So you've got, you've got some of the sound principles now and, and uh, keep that note, that sheet uh, close at hand and explore uh, and see what tastes good uh, for you. That's very nice, Martha. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to have you in the class. You're a fantastic student. I, I definitely appreciate that.